There's two reasons why you're listening to this today. One, you know me and support me. Or two, you're a nosy old shy. Either way, I'm happy to have you. You're listening to episode two of the Unedited Podcast. Do you think you can handle it? Do you think you could? Do you think you could handle it? Do you think you could? The first thing I'll tell you about episode two is I called my most famous friend. Now, why did I do that? I did it because she's my most famous friend and because I knew she'd do it. Because she always does. She's always there to support me. Not only her, our other friend, Emma McGill. These girls have been there for me since I've been four years old. We don't ring each other every day. We don't have the same fashion sense. We don't even have the same goals and aspirations. But we do have a great love for each other. We inspire each other and we celebrate each other's individuality. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because it's vital that you notice and acknowledge them relationships in your life. Because I have to say, these two girls give me great fulfilment. They give me great security. I know they're always there for me. And there's a lot to be said for that. You need that support, especially as a woman, a young woman. You need that support. You need your friends in your life. But you also have to assess the sort of friends that you need in your life. And it's the ones that don't give you any pressure. The ones that make you feel like you. And I guarantee you when I'm around these girls, I always feel like me. You want to sit around people that you can breathe around. And that's how I feel about Emma and Gemma. Now, although Emma doesn't talk on this podcast, me and Gemma share some stories. We have a little giggle. We talk about a shy. We reference our support systems and what they mean to us. But the standout thing of all is the connection that we share together. And I just love it. And I wanted to share it with you. And I hope it makes you acknowledge the relationships that you have in your life. So if you take anything away from this episode, know that you're not alone. There's always somebody that loves you. And be grateful for the people that you have around you. Because it's bleeding deadly. Gemma Dunleavy. Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. How lucky am I that one of my bestest, oldest friends is in fact Gemma Dunleavy. <laughs> <laughs> I could say the same, I could say the same. Oh, thanks so much. So for anyone that doesn't know, me and Gemma first met each other when we were four in St. Vincent's Girls School in North Strand. And then we went on to secondary school together um, in St. Mary's Holy Faith, Colester. And uh, we have been together every sin- ever since. Yeah. And you have been there for me at every single thing that I have ever needed you to, especially this podcast, because I need all of your followers. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway... Um, for anyone that doesn't know Gemma, she is one of the most authentic, amazing artists in Dublin at the moment. And you're absolutely bossing it. So only a couple of weeks ago, we watched the play at the Olympia. What was that like? Oh, it was amazing. Do you know what was so uh, brilliant about that was actually having all my old pals there. Because, you know, I feel like the stuff that I'm playing is all... And even the way this, the stage was set up, I wanted it to feel like home. And I really thought about all those elements, but I actually hadn't thought about the element of how much the people in the audience would bring that home into mm. the room. So it was deadly. I feel like I was picking out faces in the crowd all night, you know, that were just like solidifying that feeling of home. Yeah, well, amazing. you did. You really engaged with the crowd because there was definitely moments and I was like, she's looking at me. Yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> you were. And yeah. then you're forced. One of the first times I seen you play was when we went to that little intimate gig that you did in mm. the Walkmans. That was amazing for yeah. me. To yeah, watch I loved you do that. that. Yeah, that was really, really nice. And I loved how you went around doing them. That was mm. so, so great. And it was the first time that I got to see you do your thing in your comfort zone just absolutely rocking it. it was brilliant and if anybody hasn't been to any of Gemma's gigs like you're in for a treat you're definitely sort of like you're you're so surprised and I think when you listen to your music and then when you actually go to a gig I, f- I found it so surprising like you're like even better life <laughs> you are uh, though thanks there's so. like a rawness or something to the show's yeah, so I feel like the, the intimate shows allow you to, say, connect with the audience. You can have a bit of a buzz, a bit of banter. And then when you're doing the bigger shows, there's a bit a bit of room there to kind of put effort and time into, say, a stage design mm-hmm. and whatever. But what I found with those intimate shows is that I never wanted to lose that 
back and forth with the audience. That was the first time I ever had that. I used to just have music from front to back and I barely would talk. Yeah. Which is weird for me, because you know I don't shut up. Like, exactly, you know? I know. Remember, we only have 30 minutes now, so don't start taking the piss on No, this exactly, and I'm actually already sweating over that. So like... <laughs> I know, yeah, I know. But you know what I wanted to point out as well? It's the style, because mm. I've watched you since we were kids, and you have been grinding and grinding this. Mm. Like, you know, you, regardless of whether it was music or not, you wanted to be a star when you were little. It was inevitable yeah. you were always going to be famous. You know, you were going to be somebody. Mm. And that was clear. It was clear to all of us when we were kids. So we all gathered, I think it was in Emma's house, and we all stayed for a sleepover just so we could stay up late and watch it on the late late. Yeah. Doing the Thai show karaoke. And you know what? I had such FOMO. I was in the green room in RT going on the late late show, and all I could think about was what you were doing at sleepover. Uh, <laughs> it's gas. We had a ball. I swear <laughs> to God, I was like, oh, I wish this was on the week after. I was like, oh, I swear. But come here, the truth was, we only had that little sleepover over just so we could watch you yeah. you know and it was brilliant and like even though we were all just kids it was still so inspiring like our pal was on the telly it was deadly yeah absolutely deadly we were all in whole flat and coke phyllis wasn't it and it was just amazing yeah but the thing was when we were kids you were always a dancer it yeah. was always dancing so when did it switch to singing I think I loved music from mm. when I was younger so I I was always into singing um but I knew that I could sing at home myself, but I couldn't train myself to be a dancer mm. because I needed the expertise and I needed, say, training in ballet, which I couldn't just teach myself. Bear in mind as well, the internet wasn't as expansive back then as it is now. I mm. think you can nearly teach yourself anything now. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was definitely, I felt like I had to study dance in order to be the dancer that I wanted to be and then it was true injury I got an injury I, I shied away from singing for years yeah when I really got into dance and uh I'd be singing in the shower and all and me ma used to be saying to our sisters I swear she's she's a great singer and waiting to hear her and then I'd be in the shower and I'd see you know the old house phones you know the cordless ones with yeah. the big you know? mm-hmm. I'd be in the shower singing and I'd just see a hand creeping in on the phone <laughs> 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 Like ringing our sister and being like, wait and you hear her. We just, we just like me, man. We just say she's like Sally O Coronation Street, you know? Where yeah. Like, uh, my, my young one. But now, uh, she was always like that though, Jackie, wasn't she? She's yeah. like, yeah, she is your biggest supporter. No, she is. Yeah, she is. for sure. And I'm so lucky yeah. to have her. And like, the length she went to to make it happen for you. Like, you were on that lately. She had the clothes down. She was sitting at home crocheting that top yeah. for you on that hat. Yeah. And then, She's made you every item of clothing since. She's still doing that. Yeah, yeah. I know. And, and but I'm, not only that, put, getting put through the classes and stuff like, like not everybody in our area was going to ballet. Not everybody mm. was doing all those extra classes, you yeah. know. And she, she, she was grinding a fight as well. I do say to her like, you would actually put me off having kids because <laughs> I couldn't do what you did. Well, I know. Like, see that one picking me up as, from school, getting a bus over to Portobello, sitting in a sitting in a room for four hours waiting on me to finish with a load of mm. mas that were sitting around talking about what new, uh, like, expensive car they're just buying and yeah. my man's sitting there feeling real out of place. And she put herself in those positions and situations for me that I just think, fair play to you, thanks and all, but, like... Fair play to because mm. I couldn't do that. It's um, amazing though, isn't it? Yeah. It no, really it is. is amazing that she did. And uh, if I'm being honest now that I'm a math too, you will do it. <laughs> and that's <laughs> what my ma does yeah. always say to me. Because I just say, how did you do Because my ma was real, was never someone that wanted kids around. She's mm. loads of nieces and nephews and I think her head used to be melted by them. Mm. And... When she had me shut out, everything just changed. Do you know? I'll have to ask her though. I wonder, like, she must have seen such promise in you to go to all that efforts. Because, I mean, if you had a kid that you just thought, they just don't have it. Would you still drag your arse over to Portobello? You'd mm. wonder, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. She must have known there was something about you. I, de- I think she probably did see that. Otherwise, she would have been wasting her money, wouldn't she? But, yeah. Uh, did, you, did you ever feel the pressure, though, to do it for her? Weirdly, no. But Why? I don't feel pressure to do it for anybody other than myself and I suppose in turn mm. that is helping her or that's like filling her pride and kind of feels like it's giving back for all the stuff she put in you know yeah it must but be an amazing feeling though because it is it is and I I forget you're so in it you forget to look back you're you know like say all the week running up to me show in the Olympia 
Mm. You're kind of just in it and you're just thinking about getting things done and, and it's great and it's amazing and I always try to freeze in those moments and go, take this in, take this in and I think I'm good at that. But then it was after the gig, uh, one of my friends messaged me and was like, oh, I couldn't stop looking at your ma. That was and you said that to me. That's yeah. for sure, yeah. Mm. And that actually, that gave me a perspective that I didn't have before and that mm. gave me a real comfort it wasn't even something that I was seeking out or looking for but I kind of it, it, it reminds you kind of just go oh god yeah and I'm so happy yeah. that she can have that because like I said like you know like all them days all them bus trips all that money mm. like to be able to stand there and watch our kid like it was brilliant yeah was and like really, really things brilliant. as well like I was I was tough work not only when I was a teenager but when I was a kid because my nanny was like so many of us were reared by your nannies back then mm. but like my nanny's word was the gospel and when my nanny passed away my ma had a hard time like n- me ponies were never smooth enough there was always bumps in me hair there was always bubbles in me stockings mm. I don't even know what that means but nothing she could do was right for me for the first while do you know right, and right. and this is all while I'd be doing all that dancing and stuff you this know this is when you lost your nanny was it yeah right. now I barely remember this but yeah my ma just be telling me stories and she'd just say she, she used to have to get me auntie and all down because I'd be having more they're like because yeah. they couldn't do it me, me nanny wouldn't do me hair like that yeah. me nanny my poor nanny was riddled with arthritis I don't think she ever did a pony in me hair in her life I think it's just she, a touch it is yeah but it's uh, just a nanny's touch but but it's funny because as we, we do me me ma just be telling me stories about say years ago stuff yeah. that stuff that I'd forget like um it was funny because I was listening to your last podcast right. and you were talking about the entrepreneurial by the way skills. can I just mention I sent you that podcast a week previous so you could have an early board preview yeah and you listen to that on the way here more or less. true <laughs> true Gemma fashion, fashion. one yeah. thing about me yeah. I'm always late yeah I think we did often do our homework on the bus or in the class. Yeah. Or, or copy ch- someone else's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or just not at all. <laughs> I know, yeah. Thank God but, uh, for Emma McGill for that homework. Yeah. <laughs> I have to I have to give your listeners a gas story about us in school. Well, Do you remember the day we decided to go on the Mitch? <gasps> <laughs> right. Which one? So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so me and Jessica Decided to go on the Mitch. Can you decided... explain what the Mitch is? Not everyone's oh, going to know yeah, what the sorry. Mitch is. It's when you, you bunk off, you bunk you off, know. yeah. yeah. Uh, and we were always going to be up for that. So the older <laughs> classes, um, the older classes were allowed to go home for lunch. We mm. weren't. And me and Jessica decided to go home. So we go home. We're like, who? where can we go? Who, where, where can we go? We won't get caught. I'm like, we go to my house. Me ma be in work. No one will be there. Be grand. We can in and out. No one will know idea. So we go home. We're loving the Elizabeth Arden Foundation. on It's <laughs> like cement. We're in the house. I don't even think I relaxed. I was so on edge. You were so on edge and you were so flighty. Like, (laughs) remember, you were about 17 when you took a growth spirit. So you were about three foot tall. (laughs) You were all dangly moving around real fast. And the whole purpose of being back at your house was to not move a thing so she wouldn't (laughs) detect that anyone was in the house while she was gone. Which, by the way, but your neighbours and all, why did we think that was even possible? Ticks. I know. Two ticks is all I can say. I know. So we get into the house. I don't even know, did we have a cup of tea? I think we just put it in We just walked around yeah. for a minute, I think. Put yeah. that makeup on and left. Popped the colours. Oh did all, everything with the uniform that we weren't allowed to yeah. do. Had a look in the mirror. Right, come on, we go. My dog, Dane, was in the house. Dane's, Dane's after doing a big poop. We first of all had to get in. <laughs> and the Dane's dog's a big in. giant Kerry blue, like. Yeah. And does a big L shy, a big shy, <laughs> a big puddle of piss in the middle of the kitchen floor. So we get into the house and we're like, oh my God, oh my God, what we got, can't clean up. So if I clean it up, then she's going to know we're here. <laughs> the smell, the smell. smell. <laughs> so she, Jessica was like, you know, like, like heaving in the kitchen. I'm like, please, we stop. were always sensitive on the stomachs. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we're, go- we're gone and the dog is barking, <laughs> trying to get up with us. So I t- tried to get the dog away from us. I pick up his ball and I throw it. <laughs> I can <laughs> still see it now. I'll treat, I'll treat for it. <laughs> okay, then. <Yeah. laughs> Threw the ball. Knocked into a bottle of that pink phosphor tonic that you used to get in Dr. Dr. Foley's. Dr. Foley's, The yeah. syrupy tick thing. Yeah. Falls down off the cabinet. Smashes straight into the dog shite. Mm. And there was this just mess. And I'm like... How am I going to explain that bottle of medicine getting from that cabinet that hasn't fallen off in mm. the last two years yeah. onto the floor? 
Yeah, it I was. I know. We were con women. And there's another time we did it as well. And I went home to the flats and my nanny was there. Now, my nanny was in work all day. So I thought it was like smart to go home. And went in and my poor old nanny is there on the couch with food poisoning. And she was as white as a sheet. And she asked me, what are you doing home? I said, I just had a feeling something wasn't right. <laughs> Oh, uh, like, true. And she, she, to this day, I never told her the truth. Sure, do you remember one time I just really wanted to go to yours after school and I hadn't asked me ma? You always wanted to go to my house yeah. for whatever reason. And I, I went to stay to over. No. I went to, to your own bedroom. <laughs> yeah. I was mad for going to everyone's house. I, I just loved it. Like, And I went up to your house and I was just, I think I left it about five minutes. I was getting collected by my auntie or something and... Mm. It was five minutes and no one had showed up, so I did the whole, like, oh, no one's collecting me, I'm, they forgot about me, I'll have to go home with Jessica. <laughs> and poor man was looking for me for hours. Where is she, where is she? And I got up to yours, we walked up to yeah. Garner Street, I remember, mm. saying to her, Nanny Sylvie, can I ring me ma? Like, ringing her and walking me ma. I was like, where are yeah. you? Oh my God, they have to I call this big drama. Like, with... But yeah, so let's talk about how we were... From Dublin 1, mm. we went to school in Dublin 1 in primary school. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet we weren't really, like, immersed in the community as much as other kids from around mm. because we had these extra activities. So I went to the Gaiety and I was all about doing my drama and you were doing your ballet and things like that. So we went outside and really at that time they were, like, different worlds, weren't they? Mm. Yeah, totally. So I remember sharing a story with you that I was... When I went uh, to the drama school... I stayed for about three plays and I absolutely loved it. I loved doing the scripts and learning and doing my shows. I absolutely loved it. And then I just couldn't gel with people because Mm. they were from a totally different world to me. And then I started to become a bit conscious of my accent. Mm. And although the other kids probably weren't like that at all, in my little head, I just started to get a little bit self-conscious about it Mm. and I decided to leave and Mm. I never pursued it. But you stayed and... Mm kept carrying on and I just wondered like was that ever anything that was that you were conscious of when you were in that world yeah yeah it was something that I was conscious of um and it was a real you know like we grew up with the you have your telephone voice you know and uh like it was always real your normal wasn't acceptable enough in certain situations your normal wasn't eloquent enough even though I didn't know what that word was Mm. back then but you know it always felt like you had to step it up a notch when you were talking to people that weren't from your same area community Mm. background upbringing um and it didn't become like I didn't mind them thinking stuff about me but what used to really like hurt me and upset me and I say hurt and upset now because I understand my feelings, but back then I didn't act you hard or upset. To it. I acted angry, right. and I, in a minute, like right. you know, like we were always like that in school, very quick witted and very like sharp. Mm. And like you, especially, I never forget you telling that tennis teacher in school. <laughs> I don't know if that's <laughs> she <should> be it. <laughs> <laughs> where the racket was gonna go, where the sun didn't shine. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, you know, and just stuff like. You know, I'd be, you'd be well able to to stand up for yourself in situations like that. And I felt like I was always good at that. But it was when I felt the people close to me being judged or when I felt that there was an opportunity for someone else to judge the people close to me. That's the stuff that would keep me up at night. That's the stuff that would get me in trouble. That's the stuff that would, you know. And what sort of thing, like, could you give an example of... Why you felt like they were being judged? Well, like, let's say when I was in ballet, we'd be sitting... And th- this didn't only happen in ballet. This also happened in school, you know, with teachers uh, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, it Happened a lot yeah, with teachers. I um, and Should I you remember used... that one? Who said about us? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we would never... Mount mount a nut. Mount a nut. Well, excuse no. me. <laughs> <laughs> but let's call her out now. I'm messing. Yeah. <laughs> But like, you know, like there was a lot of that and you, when you're in situations like you're in a social group, mm. everyone's at the one level. So you can kind of have a, you can have a, a a slag off or you can, you know, if someone puts you down, you can put them down, right? Yeah. You can't do that in school. Mm. You get suspended. That's what would happen to me. So yeah. anytime I lashed out, it was like, right, she's getting suspended, she's getting detention, whatever. But in other situations like 
let's say I remember being in ballet one day and all the young ones were talking about their dad's car. Now, these are like, you know, like executives and big mm. companies and stuff like that. And my dad be picking me up in his truck. Like, yeah. now, this is my dad going to work at five in the morning, truck driver, doing long haul drives, like, yeah. um, finishing at seven at night. And then if he drives home to Sherver, it's going to the traffic getting back over to Portobello yeah. to collect me. So he would just grab something quick to eat in the truck, drive over and wait outside till I was finished at half nine. Yeah. You know, and I'd be gassed because I'd be climbing up the truck, you know, like climbing up the steps of it in my ballet shoes and stuff. But the fact that he went out of his way that much to do that mm. and then you'd have like people sniggering, do you know what I mean? Because like, because it was a weird way to be collected, like, you yeah. know, and stuff like that. Now, it didn't, it didn't have a huge, like, I can't, I can't say that that actually did any, like, damage or anything yeah. like that, you know. But there were just little things that you picked up on that yeah. you're like, right, me peer beside me here in this class doesn't have to deal with that. We learned, like, we learned, say, out in the playground or out in the flat or wherever you're playing, mm. your way of getting by was being quick-witted and if, if someone hits you, you hit them back. Yeah. If doing, yeah. you don't get away with that and those yeah well I don't think I think it was brilliant for us to be going into situations like that like to be put in a class outside of your usual area outside of the usual world or people that you're used to I think both of us learned a lot from that Totally. You know, like, definitely, like, even when you look at the sort of friends that we have now, mm. there's people from all different walks of life, different sorts of accents, like, you know, and we get on equally with everybody, and it's great to explore all different sorts of people. Totally. So I definitely don't look back and think that um, there was any negative to it. No. But it's just, it's interesting to look back and observe and just notice yeah. the differences of what you learn, you know, mm. as you get on and as you evolve in life and, yeah. you know. And here it opened my eyes as well because mm. before I went to these, uh, like, classes or different things where I was in a different environment, I actually did have, a, have like, a preconception that of other I, was, I was going to be judged and also mm. because these people are going to be snobby yeah. or they're going to be... And that no, was not all, the case. I know. That wasn't the case. It was the case. Yeah. It was the case some of the times. That's what I mean about when I said I was finishing up because... I felt in my head that... But that was me putting a little block up, mm. you know? Me, I just automatically assumed that these people just wouldn't get on with me. Yeah. Which was ludicrous when it's you mad. think about it now. Yeah. 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 Um, I just want to ask you another thing. Like, with the career and the music business mm. and all, you see them, you're so family-orientated and you love your friends group and you love being Irish and from Dublin. Like, could anything make you move... Yeah, 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 like, I mean, I don't know about permanently, but yeah. if there was, if my work takes me somewhere, mm. um, absolutely, I'd go there. Like, I think I have, like, a, I have, like, a bungee cord to, <laughs> to like, share <laughs> street. So I feel like I'll always be dipping in and out of there, but I, I couldn't see myself moving long term anywhere. Mm. I've yet to find that place. I'm not saying I wouldn't move, especially with the state of... Dublin now, like I can't find anywhere to live here. I know. Um, you know, and yeah, so it's just uh, it really kind of is like it's the whole the whole idea of moving just for the sake of living life. Yeah, would be vibe to me because for me, living life like me, the kids around me, me family, me friends, they're all vital to that. Yeah. So I can't live me life without them if they're not a part of it. Yeah. Um. So if I was to move just for a living, it would have to be somewhere where either they all came or where I mm. went home every few weeks. And that's not really feasible either. But for work, absolutely, 100%. I'd go anywhere for work. I wouldn't even know, need to know where I am. Yeah. As long as I'm fulfilling my purpose and doing what I mm. feel like I, you know, I'm meant to be doing. And with work now, so up the flats is done. Mm-hmm. Played the Olympia. Fucking deadly. Yeah. And what are you doing now? So I'm loads of festivals coming up this summer. I'm playing AVA, Forbidden Fruit, Sea Sessions, Electric Picnic and All Together Now. <laughs> yeah. Now see, she says that's so cool. And, calm, <laughs> and I think of like three foot tall Gemma dropping a bottle of Foley's tonic over a big lump of shy. <laughs> she would lose her head if she Come knew here. that. I'm Deadly. still a scatty. I might I know look like I have everything together. <laughs> I'm still a scatty. 
Um, I know, but it's just really, 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 really deadly. Mm, yeah. I'm so, so proud of you. It's amazing. And likewise, and do you know what I think? I genuinely think, like, we were so fortunate in the friends we had around us as well. Because, yeah. like, it's like you have to say our friends are a reflection of yourself. And we constantly had each other to be around and, like, yeah. our group of friends and, like, Emma since we're, like, mm. four. We and definitely had that quality it's like, over quantity thing from oh, day did. one, didn't we? We did. And yeah. we had... It's like, if you look in the mirror at yourself and you think you look gorgeous, you're going to go out having a, you know, a doubt-free day. You're going to feel secure in yourself. Yeah. You know, you're you're starting up at, at quite a high and strong foundation because you're not insecure about how you look or feel, right? Yeah. Based on your appearance. So, like, they say your friends are a, a reflection of you. When you think of it, like... The three of us especially, we, we had this, we, if we were looking in a mirror, like, we had this, like, grounded, strong, fiery reflection back at us all the time. Yeah. So if I came into school and I was having self-doubt that day, I have the two of used to look at and, like, you know, Emma being so grounded and having her head screwed on and always, like, knowing where yeah. she, always, always feeling like she, like never doubted anything she did like yeah. you know so consistent and loads of conviction and then you just always um feeling like you were able to say what was on your mind and do and it's like mm. it's like every day being at um going to a motivational speaker's talk or something it's it's mad <laughs> i know that sounds it sounds very corny but I, know. but I do think when i think back to that we never really were alone, do you know what I mean? Oh, no, we weren't alone. And I think it's so important, and I hope other kids these days have a little group like what we did, because mm. I remember even in my secondary school days, and things were mental for me. Mm. I have to say they were mental for me at home, and me nanny, would, me nanny had to move, and I'd lost me security, you know? Yeah. It was just mental. And then I was, I was just carrying on barbarous, mm. wasn't I? Yeah. I yeah. really, really was. But when I used to come in and I'd sit with you, and I think we used to sit in that music room for lunch, didn't we? Yeah. And uh, I just always felt the as well, like me little security at that time. Yeah. And it's so important to have that, like, and I always, you know, like I say now, like, surround yourself with people that you can just breathe around mm. and completely be yourself. It's uh, funny that you say that mm. because you probably were coming in those days feeling like that, having no idea that you were giving us confidence that day. You were yeah. always, like, the cool one that was, like, you know, 10 steps ahead of us, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you kind of don't really... It's like a... works like a little ecosystem of self-belief and kind of... As well, I think it really helps. When you have consistent people around you, like, we've been mm. around one another since we're four. Yeah. I can't say we've changed much in terms of our soul. Yeah. Like, as in, you know, the person... Oh, definitely not. Mm. No. Definitely So, so not. that really... That's a huge kind of... Uh, and you know what as well, I have to say, we're still... The three of us are still going for the same stuff. Like that's Emma what I'm is so has her shit together, like, yeah. you know what, I walk. Yeah. She's so good at everything. Yeah. I mean, she... You know, she nearly designed this format for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you're still going for it, like, you mm. know. And I'm still here telling everyone else how they should feel. <laughs> 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 but I swear it's just it's great it, I, I suppose if anyone was to take anything from this conversation it's just surround yourself with the right people isn't totally. it totally and if you feel that you're in the company of someone that you just can't be yourself you know exactly what to do yeah because yeah. Yeah. that's yourself, something that we've but... always had with one another you yeah know? and like bear in mind like we're not together all the time no nope. like you barely open my whatsapps <laughs> I knew this was going to come up. You don't? I know, I'm a nightmare. It's She's terrible. a nightmare. I'm so sorry. I have to go through Emma for Gemma to get back to me, which is grand. But you know you what? Know, the the thing... bleeding gone are the days of ringing her on a cordless house phone. Oh. Any... But when you ring me phone, <clears throat> I know, I can yeah, pe- I know. I, and I'll be on to you for like two yeah, hours. She does. It's, mm. I get very overwhelmed yeah. with the messages. Oh, I, I know. Like, you <laughs> she's, know. She's that good now. I'm, <laughs> I'm as unorganised as I was back then like except worse listen I have a couple of work related questions for you Mm -hmm. right so with your mentality because you always had it since day job you always knew you were going to make it did you ever consider uh, quitting did you ever get any self doubt there's always self doubt there Um, there's always going to be self doubt I think no matter what you do Um, Mm. 
But I think mine's only ever kind of surface level. Yeah. I think I've too many strong people around me, and I know I'm so grateful to be able to say that sentence, that, like, you know, when I have friends like you, or I have, like, a ma like I do, or especially all the women around me, like, how can I doubt myself? Because I never doubt you. I never doubt Emma. I'd never in a million years doubt me, ma, or what you do, or what she does. Yeah. Or what. So, like... It doesn't make sense for me to doubt myself, you know? Mm. I doubt small things like, you know, uh, what should I wear for this thing or how should I end this song? But again, I have, like, a, an abundance of people around me that I can trust their taste and their expertise to consult about it. Yeah. So, Gemma, you're not signed to a label, are you? No. And what's the reason then for that? Um. Well, I suppose, like... At the moment, and the way the music industry is now, for me, signing to a label would only make me lose more control. Right. So, a label deal sound really flashy and amazing up front, because it sounds like basically a label signs it and gives you loads of money, but mm-hmm. it's a loan. Um, and within that, like, you can really get stuck in them. There's, there's been artists who, you know... Uh, because their Spotify isn't doing certain numbers, the, yeah, and they've made their album for the deal. The record label is like, mm, we don't know your Spotify isn't doing the right numbers yet, so we don't want you to release your album yet until it's getting better numbers. And by the time they're at this imaginary number that the label wants them to be at, their fan base has died out because they're not really doing anything. Yeah. So for me, uh, I just want to have total control. And I'm not saying never. Yeah. But the right deal for me is more important than a deal. Um, so I was lucky to do a brand deal with Dr. Martins for my mm. first EP. Um, and they basically sponsored the, the release. So they paid for a part of the studio time. Um, they were really helpful with PR and stuff like that. And that for me was amazing. There was a brand that I've grown up wearing and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Um, and Sammy got a pair. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Look after your own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, this is, you know, like that. that's kind of where I'm at with how I'm tackling if I want a deal or not. If the right one came along, if mm. the terms of it were right. Because a lot of record label deals now, the terms are awful. Does The terms leave very, very small chance for the artist to make financial gain. So for me, I release my EP without... A record label. That means that every time uh, someone buys my album, the money comes straight to me mm. instead of it going to a label and them giving me my percentage, they would get right. like whatever, 50% or mm. whatever. Actually, sometimes they'll get more of streaming. Streaming now, I think they get 80%. Yeah. Um, and the artist will get 20, which is mad. Um, so it's really admirable to take control over it. Like it's your craft, your dream, your vision, you know, it's ballsy as well, like, you know, to not jump the gun and go for it. So would you, do you think like the having control thing, like is there other elements in your life that you like? Is there a reason for that, do you think? Like apart from just the deal, like, yeah, you, you know me, like that anyway? you know me more than anyone. I've always been kind of, you know, like, uh, singing my own tune, pardon the pun, mm. but you know what I mean? Like, I never really let anyone tell me what to do and I've always been someone that is, yeah, has to be in control of what I'm doing and it was funny because, again, in your last podcast that I was cracked up when you were talking about the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial oh, thing yeah, the and the bobbins. Yeah. And I don't know if I told you this, but this, years ago, I remember me poor nanny had a, one of the chair, electric chairs that went up oh, and down the stairs. Yeah. You didn't but ask people to pay for a shot, did you? I made mint. <laughs> me nanny, me poor nanny conked out. She conked out on the sofa, right? And I'm like that nanny, nanny checking that she's properly asleep. And I went out on the road and I called all the young ones around, charged them 20 pence a go up and down, right? I had a big stack of, no you know, the way. 20 with the old, the fawn or the yeah. deer or something, right? <laughs> charged them all up and down. Me nanny wakes up in the middle of it and I just get all the stack of 20s and shoved it under. There was like a silver rack that would go up the stairs that the chair went on. Right. And then my ma was cleaning it and found all this found thing of 20s. I thought it was the best thing ever, you know. Well, it really was, actually. My mm. great nan I used to have one of them. Now, this is how different my personality is to yours as well. Although I, I, I made money out of Bobbins, with her electric chair, well, do you know what? I probably didn't think of that because there wasn't a kid in sight over there. It was in the middle of nowhere. So I just used to sit on the chair and, you know, wave like the queen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and make it, like, demand my whole family wave to me. 
And you know me. they don't go very fast. Though, so that, <laughs> you know they don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> they go so slow. We used yeah. to put the washing on it. Like you think we live in a mansion. We might get the washing fold all up, put it on the chair and press it and the thing would be like... Going like, up. Yeah. Bit of wind you, on it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> gas. Like put the washing up so we upstairs he didn't have to carry it up. Like mm. we live in like a two bedroom town. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, while I, we're on the subject of uh, your nanny. Yeah. Now I know there's loads of people in your family, so many different characters. Mm. So before we close it off, we'll have you'll have to give us a nanny mantra. Right. Now you have a you have a hat of nanny mantras, and sure, one of them even if you listen to this podcast each time, that is your song. Your, this your is the one, song. and at the very start of this that is song, the mantra that I now funny enough yeah. is a nanny mantra, and it's yeah. dark, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. says. Uh, Mind your little self now, the world is scruffy. <laughs> so every time we were leaving the house, she'd say to us, mind your little self, because the world is scruffy. And um, she said it to all of us without fail, it was our thing, you know. Deadly. And you get to a point where she'd say it and we'd answer. She'd say, mind your little self, and we'd go, because the, the world, world is scruffy. scruffy. And I just thought, I love that saying. And I have another one. This go one on. comes from a mini nanny. This one comes from a little granny who's uh, seven. Ah, oh, which one is this? Freya. Freya. Right. She says... You get what you get and you don't get upset. <laughs> and I just think that's perfect because she says it to her sister. Like if she does, but if Freya didn't get what? Yeah. If she was looking for yeah, it, be different. Sure it'd be different. That mantra yeah. would be over her shoulder yeah. out the window. You get what you get. <laughs> but, yeah, someone actually, since last week, all these different nanny mantras have been fl- like going fluctuating around. And someone said to me, I have a mammy mantra. And I says, go on, what is it? And she says, you don't get what you get from sitting in. And I was like, bleeding deadly, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. a great you one. You don't get what you yeah. get from sitting in. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? When you think of them all, literally, like, we had it all there and the minds of all them people. They, a little, they like, knew the secret, didn't they, to yeah. it all? There's mm. an inspirational, like, quote book to be made out of those nanny mentions. Every I, I don't know about Michael's one, though, you know what I mean? There's a want to. <laughs> There's a want to name. <laughs> That's gas. Anyway, come here. Thanks so much for sitting in with me tonight. I had an absolute ball. Thank you for having me. I'm I just, love it it, I'm honoured to be your second guest. I'm so proud of you that you're doing this. And I'm so excited for everyone that's going to get to hear your stories. Because you do have us on your back laughing. Uh, also comforted and just feeling That's so at home. That's why I'm more doing with you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I leave it there then. Yeah, leave it there. Listen, I will be here again next week if you're nosy enough. Do you think you can hide?